Hello, and thank you for joining today's virtual education program with Cancer Support Community Los Angeles. I'm Larissa Montalvo, the program manager at CSCLA, and I welcome you to this week's webinar titled, Frankly Speaking About Cancer, What Do I Tell the Kids? Today, we are joined by our very own clinical and youth manager, Sigal Khan, to discuss how to approach the topic of cancer with your children. Sigal will provide information about a child's general understanding of cancer, ways to talk to them about cancer, some common behaviors you may see, and ways to support your family throughout the experience. Before we begin, if this is your first time joining us, Cancer Support Community Los Angeles is a premier nonprofit organization providing vital social and emotional support to families facing cancer, including patients, caregivers, and their loved ones, all at no cost. Our programs include support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, social activities, and educational programs such as this one. If you would like to learn more about our services or to watch our past webinars, please visit our website at www.cancersupportla.org. So without further ado, I would like to welcome today's speaker. Sagal Khan is a licensed clinical social worker who spearheads our child, teen, and family program at CSCLA as a clinical and youth manager. Sigal came to us from UCLA Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital, where she provided group and individual therapy for clients with various mental health conditions. She has a master's degree in social work from UCLA and has been working in the field for over 14 years. Sigal also has a plethora of experience working with young adults and children, thanks to her role as a national program director at Camp Kesson. Welcome, Sigal. We're so excited to be hosting you today. So thanks again, Larissa. I am happy to be here today to discuss this topic. We all know that a cancer diagnosis can really change things in a family and impact each person differently. And today I wanna to focus on the child's experience. Oftentimes so much attention is paid to the person living with cancer, whether that's a parent, a sibling or another relative, that a child's needs can be overlooked. Um, or perhaps adults are looking to protect children from the situation and don't realize that keeping secrets about treatment also impacts them. So today I'd like to spend some time really focusing on this topic of what do I tell the kids? So our overview of what we're gonna discuss is here. We're gonna cover a few main topics. First, what kids understand. So I'm gonna talk about generally what children and teens understand about cancer at different stages of development. Then I'll cover the importance of actually talking with children about cancer rather than keeping them in the dark about it. Next, I'll share a few tips for answering questions that kids may have when discussing cancer. Then I'll discuss ways to help your child through this difficult time. And finally, I'll share some resources at the end of the presentation and make sure we leave time for any questions. All right, so starting, as I mentioned, we're gonna discuss generally what kids understand at different um, times in their life. So that said, every child is unique and it may be that you have two children who are close in age they have very different needs and experiences. So there might be two siblings in the same household who have very different experiences or two kids in the same classroom who have different experiences. As this quote says, I feel things need to be approached differently for different kids slash personalities. It's not a one size fits all thing, even with siblings. Kids should not be forced to act, feel, et cetera, a certain way. And I very much agree. So I'm gonna do my best to give an overview of what generally kids understand at different stages but keep in mind that every child is different. So we'll start with the infants and toddlers. So what children understand at this age? As you can imagine, at this age, there's not really an understanding of cancer, but they are able to sense changes occurring in the family system. They do notice changes in day-to-day -day routine, and they do have some awareness of changes in behavior or emotions they might see. As for common behaviors and feelings, the common behaviors and feelings listed here will sound familiar to anyone who's had a child this age, um, but what I want to focus on here is that they're presenting with more of them. So there are more bigger tantrums. Um, there are more changes in eating or sleeping habits than usual, or, there, or there's more separation anxiety and more clinginess. Um, those might be indications that they're reacting to what is going on around them and noticing that there's something that's changed. For the preschool years, about three to five, and what children understand, 
they have some understanding of simple illnesses, like having a cold, but they have little understanding of a serious illness like cancer at that age. And at this age, they tend to present with something called magical thinking. And what this means is that they think they did something to cause cancer. Like maybe they misbehave, so therefore they cause their parent to get cancer. That's what they think in their mind. Um, and common feelings and behaviors at this age, you'll see that you um, may notice regression, meaning that they act younger than they are. An example of this would be if a child was potty trained and all of a sudden they start having accidents. You might also notice short and intense emotional outbursts. Um, children this age may ask questions over and over again related to cancer. There might be more separation anxiety or clinginess. And you may see them playing or acting out themes related to going to the doctor or being sick. Those are very common. All right. Next, when we get to kids around six to eight-ish, um, they usually have more of an understanding that there's a difference between an illness like a cold and a more serious illness like cancer. But they still may have some misinformation about what cancer is. For example, they may think it's contagious like a cold. Um, also, you'll continue to see that magical thinking I mentioned before with this age group sometimes too. As for common behaviors and feelings, um, with these kids, it's similar to ones we previously discussed. You may notice regression again, worry or fear about the person who is sick or worrying that others may get sick. Um, you may see lots of asking questions with these kids at this age again. Um, they may have difficulty separating from caregivers. You may notice them playing out or acting themes related to illness again. And new to this age group, um, you might see some anger start to come up. So especially if routines are changed, like missing an event because their parent is sick, you might see anger start to show. And children in this age group may also distance themselves from a sick family member because they feel uncomfortable or afraid and they're not sure how to be around them. All right, now for the nine to 12 year olds. Um, around this age, in terms of understanding, they have an understanding of cancer at a basic level. They've probably heard of cancer at this point. They may even know someone who has cancer, um, but still present at this age, there's some misinformation and some magical thinking. As for common behaviors and feelings, um, some of the same ones are present with these children this age. Um, with the addition of possibly hiding feelings from the family or friends um, or expressing their fear and sadness as anger, and this might be directed at family members. And also listed here is embarrassment. So you may see these kids feeling embarrassed by the fact that their family member is sick and therefore different from their friends, parents, and such. All right. And the teenager years. So as far as what children understand and the teen years, they have a basic understanding of cancer usually at this point and may even know some of the medical terminology. Um, they do sometimes continue to have misinformation too, though. And at this point, you may see teens thinking more complexly about life and death or the meaning of life. They might be open to having those kinds of conversations. As for common behaviors and feelings, when we hit the teen years, you may notice teens grappling with a desire for independence, and yet at the same time, also wanting to stay close to the family during this time. They often continue to display anger if routines are changed. They may hide their feelings, um, and it's very common to see them take out their anger or frustration on their family members. All right, so now we've reviewed the common things children and teens understand and behaviors and feelings to look out for at different ages. Let's get into actually talking about cancer with children. So oftentimes people are worried that talking about cancer will scare children and therefore they try to protect them by not talking about it. We find though that children know when something is up and it's actually better to be open and honest about it rather than leave it to the imagination, um, rather than them thinking you're hiding something from them. As this quote from a parent living with cancer says, my children would rather I communicate openly than leave it to the imagination. While imagination is great, in this case, knowing the bad results, oops, sorry. 
that cancer can lead to, they would rather have the knowledge. So again, this is talking about being really open and honest with them. We don't want them to be guessing about what's going on and using their imagination to think about the worst case possibility. So talking about cancer, when you're thinking about having a conversation with a child, first prepare yourself. Prepare for possible questions and feelings that may come up for the child. And also prepare for your own feelings that may come up as you talk about this topic. It might be just as difficult for you. Um, it may end up that the child ends up not having questions and it's just quiet and that's okay. You can just let them know you're available if they want to talk at another time and kind of leave the door open. Also consider the timing of the conversation. You'll want to be mindful about when you have this talk. You probably know your child best and when are good times, but make sure to avoid times when there could be interruptions or when the child is hungry or tired or stressed. Those are probably not going to be the best times to have a serious conversation like this. Something else to consider is to maybe have this conversation when direct eye contact isn't required. Like when you're taking a walk or driving in the car, um, sometimes it feels easier for everybody to have a conversation at a time like that. Next, in terms of language, try to use clear and simple language to help the child understand the facts about cancer and what is happening. So maybe even consider using their language through books. There are many children's books about cancer and illnesses in general um, and about change and loss. So you may consider using some books to help you find the words to talk about cancer. Physical presence is also important. It may be that talking about cancer feels too difficult. And if that's the case, you can also help the child simply by being present and creating a safe and secure space. And likely they'll then feel more comfortable to have a conversation at some point. Some key points you wanna make when speaking with children about cancer. One, cancer is not their fault. Often children think they did something to cause the cancer. So it's important to be very clear that they know it's not their fault. Two, any question is okay. So let the child know that any question is okay and they'll do your best to answer all their questions. And three, cancer is not contagious. So as I mentioned before, many children think cancer is contagious. So make sure they know that it's okay to be close to people who have cancer and they won't catch it. This might be especially important now in the time of COVID when I'm sure our kids are even more hypervigilant about these things. I also want to encourage keeping the lines of communication open. So have brief check-ins with the child. Keep them in the loop. This will help them feel comforted and reassure them that you're not hiding anything from them. So even if things haven't changed, just check in occasionally. Next up, common questions and tips for answering. So there are a few common questions that tend to come up with children when discussing cancer, and it can be helpful to think about what you may say in advance of your conversation. Of course, taking into consideration, as I said before, that each child is unique and in a different stage developmentally. So your answers to these questions will vary depending on the child. But here are some common ones. First, what is cancer? So when answering this question, you may want to explain that your body is made up of cells and usually cells are healthy, but sometimes there are unhealthy cells that grow and that's called cancer. Then you can go into more detail about the part of the body that's affected by cancer if you want, such as saying the cancer is in the lungs or the cancer is in the bones and so forth. Next, can I catch cancer? So I can't say enough how children may be worried that cancer is contagious. So it's definitely important to clarify they cannot catch cancer. It's not like catching a cold or a flu and they're safe being close to their friend who has cancer or their sibling who has cancer or their relative who has cancer. They're not going to get it from them. What is chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery? So hearing these kinds of terms can be scary to children. It's important to explain what the common treatments are and maybe even talk about possible side effects they may notice. So for chemotherapy, for example, you could say chemotherapy is a medicine that attacks cancer cells, and it can sometimes cause the person taking it to feel sick or tired. For radiation, you could say something like that's similar to an x-ray, um, and it attacks the cancer cells in a certain area. That can also cause someone to feel tired afterwards. 
And for surgery, which they're more, more likely to be familiar with, you can just say something like um, a doctor surgically removes an area where cancer is located in the body. You also could mention when talking about these treatment terms that sometimes a person with cancer will only have one type of treatment and other times they may have a combination of treatments. Another question that can often come up is why are you losing your hair? Why is so-and-so losing their hair? Um, if a child is worried about hair loss, you could explain that the treatment is so strong that it attacks the healthy cells at the same time as it attacks the unhealthy cells. And hair is made of healthy cells. So sometimes people with cancer will lose their hair, but eventually it will grow back. Next, do people with cancer die? Are you going to die? What is going to happen? So these questions can be very difficult and there's not one answer that will work for everyone. The answer will depend on the specific cancer experience, but generally it can be helpful to be honest and keep a hopeful tone. So you may wanna say something like, people can die from cancer, but many people live and the doctors are doing everything they can to get rid of the cancer. That's why there have been so many doctor's appointments. Also, children tend to worry about what will happen to them if their parent is sick and dies. So it can be reassuring to let them know who would take care of them and remind them that there are other people who do care about them in their lives. The next one, can I talk about cancer with other people like friends and teachers? So each family has a different level of comfort in terms of how much they choose to share about their cancer experience. And children may feel comfortable talking about this with others or feel like they have to keep it a secret depending on how much or how little their family is sharing with others. So even if the family chooses to keep things private, it can be helpful for a child to have at least one or two people outside of their immediate family to talk to, like a friend or a neighbor or a teacher. Next, ways to help your child. So as previously mentioned, open communication is important. Um, it's important to keep the child informed. Again, even if there are no changes, just checking in regularly can be really comforting to a child. Share and validate feelings. So it's important to share your own feelings, set an example um, with the child that it's okay to express feelings. And this will also help normalize feelings they may be having. So it can be helpful to actually say something like, it's okay to cry or feel angry. And can you tell me about how you're feeling? Keeping in mind that children look to the adults in their life to see how to react and respond to situations. Maintain routine. As difficult as it may be, especially around doctor's appointments, trying to maintain routine as much as possible can help children have some normalcy when so many things are different and out of control. Along those lines, sticking to the rules is also very important. Um, I know it can feel like it's a good time to bend the rules when it's such a difficult time, but actually sticking to the rules and maintaining boundaries helps children to feel stable and safe and secure when so much is out of control. Allow kids to help. If kids are interested in helping, you may suggest some small things they can do to help out, like cleaning their room or helping to make dinner. But be mindful about children taking on too much. Try to find a balance between the child helping out and also just being a kid doing normal kid things. And connect with school. Connecting with school is also important. Cancer may be a very private matter to the family, but sharing this information with the child's school can help the child receive extra support they may need and also can help the school provide support. So they can let you know if a child's behaving differently. So maybe the child's going to the nurse's office a lot or falling asleep in class. Those are things that the school can help you out and let you know about if you connect with them. More on ways to help your child. Um, if a child's displaying any concerning behaviors, you may want to consider seeking additional support. Some behaviors to look out for on this slide include extreme changes in behavior, such as changing changes in eating or sleeping, mood changes or acting out. Um, if the child is withdrawing from friends or family and isolating themselves, 
or difficulty at school, like misbehaving at school, or their grades are dropping, or their teachers are reporting changes in behavior. Also, if there's a loss in interest in activities they used to know, do, if your kid used to love drawing and now they won't pick up a pencil or a crayon or whatever. Um, or lastly, if they express a desire to hurt themselves or someone else, especially if this last one is present, absolutely contact a professional for additional help immediately. But I also want to note that you don't have to wait for these things to pop up to seek outside support. It can be helpful to seek that support before that as well, um, just to have a place where your child can talk to somebody about what's going on can be really important. Next, some resources, as I promised. So speaking of support, I want to share some CSC resources. So first is the Cancer Support Helpline. This is staffed by licensed professionals who can assist you with guidance and resources for a variety of needs, like identifying a local support group or other resources that may be helpful. They're available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern, and Saturday and Sunday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. CSC also, uh, sorry, CSC also offers open to options, and that's a program where a trained specialist sits down with you to discuss your cancer experience and helps you prepare a written list of specific questions to share with your doctor. And that can be really helpful if you're feeling overwhelmed and not sure what to ask about or where to start. Next, frankly speaking about cancer is what we're here doing today. This is part of a CSC education series on a variety of topics important to people affected by cancer. Um, and there are more of these talks that you can find um, online. Speaking of finding more online, sorry, I jumped ahead before. Um, so much of what has been discussed today can be found online in the Frankly Speaking About Cancer, What Do I Tell the Kids book. So there's actually a physical book. Um, and there's a link at the bottom of the screen um, to a PDF version of that. So if you want to, maybe we can put that in the chat at the end too, Larissa. Um, so a lot of this information available in that book. Also, there's a five minute kind of version of this book that you can find online on YouTube. So this covers a lot of what we talked about today, the child's general understanding of cancer, ways to talk about cancer, common behaviors you may see, ways to support children. Um, so that five minute video, the YouTube link is there as well. And maybe we can share that one too when we're wrapping up in the chat. Some additional resources outside of CSC. So first off is Camp Kesem. Camp Kesem is an organization near and dear to my heart as Larissa mentioned in my bio. Um, Camp Kesem provides free summer camps for children whose parents have or have had cancer. And there are over a hundred camps across the country. Um, cancer Care is another great resource. They provide counseling, case management, support groups, educational workshops, case management, um, financial assistance, and more. Children's Treehouse Foundation is another great organization that provides group-based manualized psychosocial support for children with a parent or caregiver who has cancer. Next on the list is Imaginary Friends Society, um, and they have a series of very cute, very fun, um, kid-friendly cancer-related videos. And lastly, Walk with Sally, is an organization that provides free one-on-one -on -one mentoring and community support to the children of loved ones who have been impacted by cancer. So if any of these resources are new to you, maybe you wanna take a quick picture with your phone of those, um, there are really great options for additional support. All right, I'm gonna change the slide. Hopefully if you needed those links, you got them there. We can also probably put them in the chat too. Um, about CSC. So I'm guessing if you're here, you're at least somewhat familiar with cancer support community. But if you'd like to learn more about the many ways CSC is working to make sure that people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community, here is a link to the headquarters website. And if you're interested in learning more about our programs at CSC LA, our website is also on this slide. And finally, if you're specifically interested in child, teen, and family-related programs at CSCLA, please feel free to reach out to me directly. 
And I would love to share more about our programs and events for children and families with you. Lastly, I wanna open it up for questions. So I will stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to you, Larissa. Thank you so much, Sagal. That was uh, nice. such a wonderful presentation and so much vital information to so many of our community members and healthcare providers who are here today. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, apologies for the dog <laughs> in the background. Uh, That's the beauty of Zoom. That's the beauty of Zoom. So while we give a couple minutes here for some questions to come in, just a reminder to everyone um, that there is a Q&A feature that you are more than welcome to drop your questions into. Um, but in the meantime, Sigal, I wanted to ask you, do you have any upcoming child, teen, and family programming that we can share with our viewers today? I'm so glad you asked. Um, yes, we do. Uh, we have a monthly family fun night, the second Tuesday of the month now happening, uh, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, actually, at 5 p.m. This is a virtual event to bring together families impacted by cancer with children under the age of 18. So anybody that has a child who has cancer, or any sort of parent or relative who has cancer is welcome to join us. We um, are doing fun things. Last month, we had a fun virtual scavenger hunt and we're going to plan some other great um, activities for families to do together monthly so we can connect um, even if we can't be together in person. Um, I don't know if you want to, should I share that flyer, Larissa? I can pull it up if you want me to. Yeah, if you would love, I'd like to pull up the flyer and share it with everyone. And then you guys can see it. So there's even a, a little QR code there. I think that could work if you wanted to go ahead and take a picture with that with your phone. You could go ahead and register. Um, but that is coming up this coming Tuesday. Thank you. So and we would be happy to have anybody who is interested in joining us um, on Tuesday. Join us. And if you can't make it this month, it'll be there the next Tuesday of the month. The next second Tuesday of the month. <laughs> we'll do some fun October Halloween kind of things. Oh, I'm excited for that one. <laughs> uh, and for those of you who didn't have the chance to scan that QR code or you're interested or would like to share it with others, this all lives on our calendar on our website. I dropped the link for our website into the chat, but it is www.cancersupportla.org. Um, I did not share all those wonderful links that Sigal shared with us because unfortunately the chat does not have a copy and paste feature. So I don't think it would be very helpful to all of you. Um, but you, if you are interested in uh, some of those resources that Sigal shared with us today, um, please feel free to email us at info, I-N-F-O, at cancersupportla.org. I will drop that in the chat again. Um, and that is info at cancersupportla.org. Um, we have, I guess, two questions coming in for you. Um, one is someone is asking, what are some of the services that you offer for children at CSCLA? Great question. Yeah, so we offer individual counseling, brief individual counseling. That's about eight sessions for free for anybody affected by cancer. So that's children and also adults. Um, so individual counseling. We are going to also be offering support groups for children. We're in the works of setting those up. So any children who want to attend a support group or a social event will have a place here at CSCLA. Um, those are in the works. If you're interested, please let me know. Please contact me and I'm happy to add you to our wait list. For now, those monthly social events I just mentioned, the family fun night are going on. Um, and we hope to also do more educational presentations geared towards the family and even some healthy lifestyle classes. Maybe we can do some yoga for kids or other kinds of activities like that to mirror our adult programs in the future. Thank you, Sigal. We are yeah. so happy to- I'm happy you. to put my email in the chat too. That's wonderful. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so we also have a member here who's, who's talking about her own specific situation. Um, but to summarize, um, she did not tell her 10 year old that she had cancer as um, COVID was happening at the same time. Um, and her 10 year old found out otherwise, um, but now no longer has any questions. So she's asking what she should do now, if you have any advice. She's not sure if, um, if she's okay, um, but she isn't sure if she should talk about it now. 
Well, as I've kind of said throughout this, I think that honesty is is really the best policy here. I think being open and honest with your child about what's going on and giving the facts, the basic facts about what has happened and where you're at now, I think is going to help them feel comforted and feel like they're in the loop. You're not hiding anything from them um, because like I said before, they can, I'm sure, sense when things are, are off. So I would just really encourage being an honest and, and open with them as much as possible. Great, thank you, Sagal. I know that every situation is different, as you said. So um, to this person who's asking this question, I would also say if you would like to talk more about it, um, our individual counseling is, is also available for both you and for um, your child if you're interested. So um, feel free to reach out if you want a little bit more clarification on your question. Absolutely, yeah, thanks. And we'll give another minute or so um, for any other questions um, that we have. Um, but Sigal, I'm, I'm another question that came to mind. Uh, do you think that it is beneficial to have the child to come to any chemo sessions? Say a parent can't find someone to watch their child, um, and so they bring them along. Um, do you think that's okay? I don't know if that would be allowed right now with COVID, but <laughs> in a non-COVID time, um, yeah, I think that goes along with the theme of just involving them in this so they feel like they're included and like they are a part of the conversation and can see and ask questions and um, know what's going on. So yeah, if you're explaining this and it feels like they are developmentally in a place where they could sit with you um, for a treatment, then I think that would be perfectly fine. Um, I think again, as we're, I feel I'm like, I'm repeating myself, but again, if, if a child is there developmentally, like you'll have to make a decision for, for yourself that that kid can be in that environment. Um, but if they are mature enough and can understand enough to be there, I think that could be a good experience to include them in that. Yeah. Um, this member is saying that they have a five and a half year old daughter that she takes to treatment. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is. I have to take Oh, she has to take her treatment home because it runs for two days. Um, at that point, physical contact is really limited. And she's wondering if you have any tips on that. That's tough. So I, I take it they're at home with their child, but they can't have much contact. I get it. Yeah. I, I think that is a hard one. And, and my heart goes out to you because when you have a kid that young, you want to be able to be with them and comfort them physically. So it might have to be other ways that you get creative with that um, while you can't um, do that kind of comfort. So I think preparing them about it when those days are coming in advance, having communication about that ahead, like this is what it's going to look like for a couple of days. Um, so they're aware and it's not coming out of nowhere. There are no surprises. Um, and then, yeah, just getting creative while they, while you are in the, that time and it's, trying to, you know, get creative with ways you can, I don't know, write to them, draw pictures with them, exchange things with them if you're feeling like you can't um, be near them at that time. It's a tough one though. Um, any last thoughts, Gal, before we close out today? I just hope that this was helpful to just kind of get some of the basics for you all and, and please pass it along if, if um, it's not your child, but there are children you're working with. If you're a healthcare professional, I think this can be a great resource um, to pass on to other families who aren't really sure how to have these conversations. But overall, I just I hope that you take from this that it's really important to keep the kids in the loop and be open and honest with them. If you're hiding things, they usually can sense it and they're going to feel better and more comfor comfortable if you're, if you're speaking with them about what's going on. So it looks like that's all the questions that we have for today. Thank you so much, Sigal, for being here with us and for all of, to all of you for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you sometime in the future. Thanks. Thanks. Take care.